I was nowhere, you came to my rescue. From the grave I've been raised. When I needed a savior to save me, Jesus, you made a way. I was blind, but these eyes have been opened. Now I walk in the light. Every step on this road I will follow. Jesus, you made a way. You are the way. You are the way. Lost and dead, but your love came to find me. Jesus, you are the way. You are the way. You are the way. You're the light shining bright in the darkness. Jesus, you are the way. Jesus, the only way. you all to stand and sing with us as we sing about the one who sees us through all things. He is the way. Come on. All my days are secure in your promise, never standing alone. You're the truth, you're the life, you're my future. Jesus, you made a way. I'm alive in the love that you give me. Free to dance once again. You will lead me from glory to glory. Jesus, you made a way. You are the way. Jesus, you are the way. Jesus, the only way. Your love came to find me, Jesus. You are the way, you are the way, you are the way. You're the light shining bright in the darkness, Jesus. You are the way. got a face not spoiled by beauty I have some scars from where I've been you've got eyes that can see right through me you're not afraid of anything they've seen I was told that I would feel nothing the first time I don't know how these cuts heal 
but in you I found the right if there is a light you can't always see and there is a world we can't always be if there is a dark that we shouldn't doubt if there is a light don't let it go out and this is a song Conversation only we could make. You're breaking into my imagination. Whatever's in there is yours to take. I was stoned. I feel nothing the first time. You were slow to heal, but this could. There is a lie you can't always see And there is a world we can't always be If there is a dark within or without And there is a lie, don't let it go out And this is a song, a song for someone This is a song Good morning, Med Church. Hey, that's pretty good. You guys are just pretty much awake. I am glad to see you here this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you make your way to Romans chapter 3? We're going to do a little work there in the middle part of Romans. Or if you're like me now, if you have your iPhone, will you tap your way over uh, to Romans chapter 3? And uh, today's a beautiful day for Christians. Christians around the world today will gather and celebrate what's known as Palm Sunday, where Jesus... Uh, on the back of a donkey, went into Jerusalem, and the people were uh, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They, they were excited that Jesus was coming. They were primarily excited because they didn't understand what was about to come over the coming week. Uh, they liked the idea that Jesus was coming uh, to take over their problems, now, not so much that he was coming to take over their lives. Now, we today, we're much more spiritually mature than they are, right? I mean, we never would just sign up for the Jesus who takes away my problem, Jesus, as opposed to the Jesus who takes over my life, Jesus, right? Uh, and so they're celebrating Jesus is on his way into Jerusalem. And uh, in, in just a few short days, some of those very same people who were shouting Hosanna on Palm Sunday would be shouting, crucify him, just a few days later. And Jesus is on his way, not just into a city. Uh, this isn't just a man on a donkey. This is a man on a mission, all right? He is on his way into Jerusalem, fully knowing what was about to ha happen. He was headed for death by crucifixion, which begs this question. 
why did Jesus have to die? I mean, couldn't God have come up with another way? Uh, I mean, I mean, let's, let's face it. Have you had anybody wrong you? How many of you have ever had anyone wrong you at some point in your right? Did, did you forgive them? Right, him for the most part. Some of them still hanging on, right? Uh, but, but for the most part, right? Uh, you forgive them, but you didn't die to do it, right? You go, so why couldn't Jesus just do what I do? Why couldn't he just kind of give it a wink and a wave and go, eh, don't worry about it. It's okay, forget it. Uh, why did God just like, was God not thinking ahead or something? And did he paint himself into a theological box? And um, why did Jesus have to die? Um, there's an answer to that tucked away in the bottom of a little paragraph in Romans chapter three. And uh, this is what, what we're gonna do. We're gonna dive into that paragraph today and we're gonna unpack it a little bit. And, and you're gonna be patient with me because it's kind of full of a bunch of theological jargon. And we're gonna try to break that apart and make it make sense in the real life world. Okay, we're gonna do that together, right? And uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna work our way through that passage and you're gonna have an aha moment. You're gonna realize why Jesus had to die. And then I'm gonna give you three things. You know why I'm gonna give you three things? I'm a preacher, that's what we do. I mean, if you stop us in a convenience store, ask for directions, we go, okay, I got three things for you. Uh, it's, if you stop by my office, you go, hey, n never mind. anyway. Um, so, and then, then I'm gonna give you three things and we're gonna tell you a story, try to bring it to life and because I'm a visual learner and then we're gonna go home, all right? And we're gonna celebrate what Christ has done for us all week long, culminating next weekend with the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Romans chapter three, verse number 21. Let's dive in. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Now, you and I read that and we go, that sounds like something out of Romans. Uh, but to these guys, this was a radically, this was a different concept than what they were used to. Check this out. But now, apart from the law, righteousness of God has been made known. In their thinking, righteousness, being righteous, right standing with God, was all about keeping the law. I mean, that's what righteous and unrighteous was. Uh, so what, what is he saying here? This righteousness apart from the law. So let, let me just pause there and, and let me talk to you for just a second about the law, okay? Um, when you bump up against the law in scripture, this is what it means. Some people say, you know, well, it means the 10 commandments. And I go, well, it includes the 10 commandments, but don't think it ends there, okay? It includes the 10 commandments, but actually, let me give you a great definition of law in scripture. Law is the collection of all God's commands regarding human behavior, okay? The law is the collection of all God's commands regarding human behavior. Now, this is what I do, so you're just gonna have to play along. I want you to repeat that after me, okay? Okay, the law is the, the, the total of all God's commands regarding human behavior, okay? So what is the law? Oh gosh, that was really weak, man. Okay, I, you guys didn't do well in school, did you? I mean, I gave you the answer before I asked you the question. Okay, the law is the sum total of all God's commands regarding human behavior. So what is the law? You guys did better when they made you go through the grade again, didn't you? I, I, I'm on to you, all right? So it's the sum total of all God's commands regarding human behavior. Uh, in the original Torah, there were 613. Uh, most conservative scholars agree in the New Testament there's 1,050. There was a group of people called the Pharisees, and evidently that wasn't enough commands for them. Uh, they, their ancestors are called Baptist. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I grew up Baptist. If you're Baptist, don't, don't, don't be offended. I, I love you. I love them. I'm going through recovery. I, 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 uh, the... Um, but the Pharisees went, well, that's not enough commands. Have you ever known anybody who just felt like, you know, there, there wasn't enough rules in, in their religion already, so they kept adding more? Uh, the Pharisees added another 248 commandments, and then that still wasn't quite enough for them, so they added, in addition to that, 365 more prohibitions. You know, they didn't want to call it a commandment, so just kind of soft sell these. And, and here's the thing. 
how, how are you doing keeping all those commands? I mean, some of them were doing okay, right? How many, how many of you, you've done well this week on not killing someone? Right, good, good, that's good. I'm doing good so far. How about loving your enemy? <laughs> that's my least favorite command in scripture. I'm, I, I know, I'm a pastor, I'm supposed to love all the commands, I get that, but I gotta tell you, that whole love your enemy thing, that one's tough for me. Because I, if I would've been writing scripture, I'd've went a different angle with that, you know? Uh, but uh, some are difficult. Love your neighbor as yourself, that's hard, isn't it? Right? I mean, as yourself, that's really difficult. So, so, okay, when we bump into the law, let me give you three things to remember, okay? And because I'm a visual learner, I'm gonna assume you are too, and I'm gonna treat you as such, all right? Here we go. I'm, I'm not gonna whack you with this. Don't, don't. <laughs> some of the people up front are going, this guy is serious on Palm Sunday. He's gonna take somebody out. Okay, here we go. When you bump into the law, and the law is simply what? Help your neighbor, okay? Okay, it's the sum total of all God's commands regarding human behavior. When you bump into the laws, there's three things you need to remember. Okay, first of all, the law is a hurdle that cannot be jumped. The law is a hurdle that cannot be jumped. You know me well enough to know what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna ask you to say that with me, all right? Here we go. The law is a hurdle that cannot be jumped. Have you figured that out by now in your life? I mean, by the time, you know, you know, we dig it down here and we go, don't kill anyone this week. And you go, I got this down. I'm good. Love your neighbor as yourself. Like, and you know what we do? We do the same thing they did in scripture. We start, oh, well, let's define who my neighbor is, <laughs> right? Okay, I'll buy in, but can we clarify exactly who's this supposed to be directed toward? The law is a hurdle. As a matter of fact, do you realize that the book of James says that if you break one law just a little bit, you're guilty of breaking all of them? So how you doing? The law is a that cannot be jumped. We, we, we all buy in, right? Okay, let me tell you something else about the law. The law is also a compass that points a direction that still needs to be traveled. The law is a compass that points a direction that still needs to be traveled. Just because we're living under grace doesn't mean it's okay to lie, steal, cheat, murder, commit adultery, right? I mean, we all agree that the law still has value. We don't just abandon the law. Uh, the things God told us to do and not to do still have value. So the law is a hurdle that cannot be jumped, but the law is also a compass that points a direction that still needs to be traveled. Now understand this, it's a direction, not a destination. A destination you arrive at, a direction you never arrive at, you just travel that way. You say, which way are you going? I say, we're going north. And you go, when are we get there? I go, where? You go, where do, when do we get to north? Well, north isn't a destination, right? It's a direction that still needs to be traveled. The law, even though we don't arrive, even though we don't get there, it's still a compass that points a direction that needs to be traveled. So the law is a... You guys are doing really well. I'm proud of you. Just turn to your neighbor and pat him on the back. Say, good job there. Uh, okay, and also the law is a... Outstanding. And the third thing is this. The law is a reminder that we need Jesus. The law is a reminder that we need Jesus. Uh, Galatians chapter three, verse 24 says that the law is a tutor to bring us to Christ. There's nothing like bumping into the impossibility of the law to remind us there has to be another way other than us getting it all right. So when you see the law in scripture, you need to remember three things. It's a... You guys are awesome, that's it, that's exactly right. Good job, give yourselves a hand, that's fantastic. Uh, okay, so, so here's the, oh yeah, all that was for Romans chapter three, verse 21. Okay, so, so, this is, so this is the point. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has, that's new territory. Uh, apart from what you do, the righteousness of, law, of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testified. They, they were pointing this direction all the time. You just didn't quite get it. Verse number 22, this righteousness is what? It doesn't say earn, does it? This righteousness is 
given through faith in who? Jesus to who? Now that was radical too, because this wasn't given to all who behave, right? But to all who, so you're saying, you're saying to us, Paul, that we can be righteous, not based on what we do, but on what we believe? And he's going, yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Uh, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And then verse number 23 is the verse in this paragraph that kind of gets all the press. And it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many of you have ever heard that, right? You guys grew up Baptist, didn't you? All right, they love that verse. <laughs> okay, uh, no, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, notice this, please notice this in context. This isn't God's way of going, nana, nana, boo, boo, you all stink. All right, uh, this, is, this isn't to bring condemnation upon you. As a matter of fact, Jesus really clearly would say, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The purpose of Romans 3.23 isn't to bring con condemnation. The purpose is, look, it's the phrase before it. There is no difference between you and me, between us and them, this one thing we all have in common, we are all sinners, right? Right? Hey, listen, me being a Christian doesn't mean I believe I'm not a sinner. I, I, I just believe, I believe I'm a saved sinner because of Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and because we come to church doesn't mean we believe we don't sin, right? Right? Right, right, right? Right? Okay, yeah. No, we don't, not at all. And I think sometimes the world looks at us and they think that we think we've got it all together. And we need to be really clear that that's not our position. Our position is we don't have it together, so we need a savior. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented Christ as a sacrifice. Here's a hint. Here's a hint to the answer to our question. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. That cleared it up, right? We can go home now? Nah, okay. Uh, through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies. Did you see it? That's the answer to our question. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies so that he could be just and the one who justifies. So he did this, say it with me, to be just and the one who justifies. One more time. To be just and the one who justifies. Listen, that is the answer to why Jesus had to die. And who is this for? Do you see it? Those who have faith in Jesus. Okay, I'm gonna give you three things and we'll try to clear this up, all right? Number one, know this. We all have a debt that we can't even fully understand and that we certainly can't pay. We all have a debt that we can't even fully understand, much less pay. We are all sinners. We have, we have sin both committed and sin inherited, if you will, all right? Uh, I had an old professor that said, we have little s sins and big s sins. Uh, and, and, and for all of us, the little s sins would be the things that we do, right? All of our behavior where we don't quite meet the mark, where we fall short, where we just get it wrong. But there's also in Romans, Paul talks about this big s sin as a force that was inherited because that our father was sinful and our father's father was sinful and our father's father's father and our father, all the way back to Adam, right? As a matter of fact, this concept is most clearly de uh, declared in Romans chapter five when he says, therefore sin entered the world by one man and death through sin. Sin entered the world by one man and death through sin. And we've all experienced that, right? I mean, not just physical death that sin causes, but have you had 
if you experienced death in a relationship, right? Some of you experienced financial death, relational death. Uh, uh, we, we've experienced the death that sin causes. But, but this is best, I think it's best described in Romans chapter 7, where the Apostle Paul's writing, and in Romans 7, uh, verse 14, he says, we know that the law is spiritual, and I absolutely love the authenticity here. He says, but I am what? (laughs) You ever felt like that? Yeah, I get the law is spiritual, but I, and this is, I mean, this is the Apostle Paul talking, right? But I am unspiritual, and and look at how he describes this, this big S noun form sin that came into the world. I'm sold as a slave to that. I do not understand what I do. This is what I know about every human I've ever met. Uh, You don't keep God's perfect law. You don't even keep a a moral law that's inside of you. As a matter of fact, hear, hear me, you don't even keep your own law. You don't even, the things that you go, this is absolutely wrong. How are you doing not doing those? I mean, just your list, right? Understand you're in good company. Here's the Apostle Paul. Look at what he says. He says, I don't understand what I do. How many of you have ever been there? You know, you go, well, what? I don't get this. What am I doing? I don't understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do. He said, he's, got, he's got a doozing problem, right? You've been there. Uh, what I want to do, I do not do. And what I hate, that I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. That big S sin is a noun form. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. You ever, you ever, you ever make God promises? Okay, I will never do A, B, C again. Never, ever, ever done done, not to, I pr- promise you, you promise your spouse, right, and the, your friends, and I'm accountable, I'm never going to do, never, does he promise yourself, and look at what he says, I have the desire to do what's good, but then I, I, end, I can't carry it out, for I do not do the good that I want to do, it's, this isn't even about God's law, this is just the stuff I, if I cherry pick the law, and just the stuff that I want to, I can't even carry that out, would you agree we have a sin problem? We have a sin. We, we've all been there. We, man, I identify with him. I, I do not do the good I want to do. The evil I want, the evil that I don't want to do, that I do. I'm going, man, I, I feel you, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, if you go on down in that passage in verse number 24, he ends up going, oh, what a wretched man that I am. <laughs> I mean, he just goes, I can't, I can't stand it. I, why do I do this? Guys, we all have a debt that we can't even fully understand that we certainly can't pay as a result of our sin problem. Now, here's the deal. Number two, because God is just, he demanded payment. Because God is just, because God, is there anything God can't do? Wait, 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 wait. Don't answer, don't answer, okay? I'm gonna ask you a question that's a trick question, so I don't want you to answer because you may be wrong, okay? Is there anything God can't do? Y- yes, yes. Actually, we won't take the time to go into it, but there are a number of things God can't do. Uh, one of the things that God can't do is God can't sin, Right? Because it, it, it breaks with his nature. The moment he sins, he's no longer God. So if God can't sin, God can't lie, right? This is easy, okay, right? Okay, you're going, is this one of the trick ones? I don't know, I started to nod. No, whoops, whoops okay, I don't know. Okay, God can't, can we, do we all agree God can't sin, right? God can't sin, if God can't sin, that means God can't lie, right? So if God can't lie, that means this, and we all agree we have a sin problem, right? So if God can't lie, God can't look at you and call you not sinful when you are, right? That presents a problem. So how can God call you not guilty when you are guilty and stay not guilty of sin himself that makes him God? How, does, how can he do that? Listen, because God is just, he demanded payment. God couldn't just look and go, ah, don't worry about it. Number three is this. Because of God's grace, he made the payment. 
Okay, Because of God's grace, he made the payment. Scripture throughout carries this theme. It's the concept of sacrificial substitutionary atonement. Uh, I, I learn better w- w- with pictures. So l- l- let me give you a picture, okay? Scott, come here. Scott Carmen, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to be our assistant today. Good, good. Give him a hand. Good, good. Cool. Okay, Scott's going to do a backflip. No, no. No, okay. <laughs> um, okay, now here's the deal. This story is just completely made up. I want you to know that, all right? I'm just telling you up front, it's completely made up. There's nothing true about it, and, uh, but, I, but I just want to make a point. So here's the deal. Let's imagine this. Imagine that we were here, we were wrapping up today, and uh, all of a sudden we heard a commotion in the back, and, and a bunch of police officers come running in, like SWAT gear and stuff, and they come running in, and uh, they come running down to the front, and they grab Scott, throw him on the ground, cuff him. Aren't you glad you volunteered? Yeah. You didn't volunteer, did you? I just call it anyway. That's all right. Uh, now you're opting for the backflip, right? Um, so they throw Scott on the ground. They drag him out, and we're all kind of puzzled. We're wondering what in the world's going on. So we're watching the news tonight, you know, and come on the news, and uh, they start telling this story about Scott and his past. And uh, uh, I'm just going to tell you a couple of things that Scott has told me that's really bad that he's done. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. Uh, we're done. <laughs> We're done. He's out. Uh, so anyway, so there's just, we realize that, there, that, that Scott, that obviously this life that he's living now is not the life he was living before. And there's just some really gruesome, I, this is made up, okay, just so you know. Uh, there's some really gruesome crimes that were committed by Scott. And we start following the story because we were there the day he got arrested at church on Palm Sunday. And, uh, and we go through and, and there's a trial and it becomes obvious after a while that Scott is absolutely guilty. Uh, and, and then they go through the sentencing phase of the trial and, uh, and they find Scott that is guilty and that is punishment is going to be death. And uh, so, again, just, just, just go with me, and, uh, and, and we're just going to pretend for a second and uh, that I'm thinking, man, you know what? I've been talking to Scott, and I think Scott has a lot. I think he's really turned the corner. I think those things are the past. I mean, he, you know, he's got a wonderful family, and I, I think that Scott has got a lot to contribute to society. So let's just say that I loved Scott so much and let's just say that our judicial system allowed this, that, that I went to the judge and I said, judge, instead of Scott dying for his crime, how about if I died in his place? Yay. That, would, <laughs> <yay. laughs> that, would, that would be, follow me on this, that would be substitutionary, right? What is a substitute? One who goes in one's place, right? That would be substitutionary atonement. Okay, it would be, I would die. And if, now, just FYI, if you just, I, I don't love you that much. Okay, I mean, I, I, I love you in a good old, hey, come here, give me a hug kind of way, but it is, that's not happening, all right? Uh, so, but let's, let's just say, and again, our judicial system doesn't allow for substitutionary atonement, but many judicial systems in, in past times have allowed for just that kind of a thing. But let's just say the judge looked at me and he said, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about this, but... I don't think I'm willing to let you die, but don't you have a daughter? I go, yeah, I've I've got three daughters. He goes, like a teenage, yeah, Hannah. Hannah, would you come here? Guys, Hannah, Hannah Bug Simon right here. You You are short. (laughs) Uh, And, uh, uh, Bug's not her official name. You don't get a call or bug. I do. Okay, uh, but let's, let's say this. Let's say the judge looked at me and he said, do you, what about your daughter, Hannah? Uh, if you'll let Hannah die in Scott's place, I'll let Scott go free. And let's just say for a minute the judge says, but before you answer, uh, understand this. We're not going to do death by lethal injection. These crimes were just too gruesome, uh, and I believe the punishment should fit the crime. So we're going to go to something... A little stronger, we're going to do death by firing squad. No, wait, wait, wait. No, before we do that, no, let's not. We're going to do death by, um, we're going to do death by, by hanging. No, no, let's don't do that. Let's go back and reach back to a form of capital punishment. We're going to do death by crucifixion. Now, guys, listen to me. It would be a lot of love, would you agree, if I loved Scott enough, 
to be willing to die in his place. But can you imagine how much more love it would be for me to be willing to let my baby girl die in his place? And just imagine with me for just a second, would you? Imagine we gather down at the courthouse, downtown Fort Worth, and imagine the day of crucifixion comes, and Hannah and I and Scott and the judge are all standing here, and, and the judge looks at me and he said, now listen, if at any time you want to call this off, man, you just give the word and we'll put a stop to it, and she'll be off and he'll be on. And imagine, if you would, that the crowds gather and they begin yelling and screaming at her. Imagine that they take my baby girl who's completely innocent. He's the one that's guilty. Imagine taking my little girl who's innocent and people begin to beat her and throw things at her. Guys, can you imagine at the moment when somebody would take my little baby girl's hand and stretch it out and put a spike right there in her wrist? And the judge looks at me and says, hey, listen, if you want to, you can put a stop to this. At any point, you just give the word and he's in and she's out. And I go, no. Can you imagine me loving him that much? Could you imagine as they started to drive the spikes into my baby girl's hands and she's looking at me and I could stop it with just a word? And the only reason I don't is because I love him that much. Could you imagine as they stretched out her other hand and they lifted her up on a cross and they put her feet over top of each other and they drove a spike down through her, her feet and the judge looks at me and says, man, you just say the word. And she looks at me and says, dad. And I look at him and I look at her and I know for him to go free, she has to be crucified. Can you fathom me loving him that much? Guys, listen to me. This isn't pretend. 2,000 years ago, that's what happened on a hill outside of Jerusalem. That's what this week is about. Guys, let's give Scott and Hannah a hand, all right? Listen to me. That's what this week is about. 2,000 years ago, Jesus stretched out on a cross and he looked at the father and said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And then he made the most incredible statement I think ever uttered over any sort through human vocal cords. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Hear me on this. We have a debt we can't understand, much less pay. Because God is just, he demanded payment. But listen to me, because of God's grace, he made the payment. Because of God's grace. Listen, how on earth can God call you not guilty? How can God call you debt-free? Here's how God calls you debt-free. He paid the debt for you. He knows you're debt-free. He paid it for you. So he can look at you and say, you owe nothing because he paid it in full. That would allow him, according to Romans chapter 3, verse number 26, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be what? Just and, get it? I say get it, you say got it, I say good. Get it? Good. Listen, so he could be just. So he's not lying when you cause, cause you debt-free. You are debt-free. He paid the price. So he could be just and the one who justifies. A wink and a wave calling you not guilty wouldn't do it, would it? A wink and a wave just saying, nah, you never accumulated that debt. That wouldn't do it, would it? That would make him not just. Why did Jesus have to die? So that God could be just and the one who justifies. Romans 5, 8 says it this way, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. What? That, that's huge right there. That three-letter word, for. Christ died what? For who? Us. Christ died what? For who? Us. Sacrificial, substitutionary atonement. Sacrificial, it costs a lot, way more than a wink and a wave. Substitutionary in our place. Atonement, com completely, completely paid the price. I love this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 says it this way. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, 
having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and did what? Condemned us. He has, say that out loud. He has what? He has done what? Listen, that is good news. We ought to call it that, right? And we ought to try to call that good. That's exactly what it's called. It's called the gospel. It's called good news. He has taken it away. Doing what with it? Listen, God can call you debt-free because he made a receipt. He stamped on it, paid in full in his blood, nailed it to the tree so he can look at those who believe in him and say, you, my friend, are not guilty. You are debt-free. How? Because he paid for us. Because he paid for us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. So what do you do with that? First of all, you do this with it. Guys, if you're here today and you've never taken that step across the faith line and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord, Lord and Savior, that's what you do first. You simply go to him and he says, if we will call upon his name, he will hear our prayer. And you ask him in simple words, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you died in my place. I believe you died in my place. And I receive that gift. It's as simple as admit, believe, receive. Admit you're a sinner. Believe Jesus died for you. Receive the gift of his salvation. Admit, believe, receive. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he died for you and receive his free gift. Second thing you do with that is this. If you are a believer, this holy week, you remember. You remember. When we come to the Lord's table and take communion, the whole purpose of it is just simply remembering. This week, as you go through this week, take time to stop. Think about the huge price that God paid for your forgiveness. Remember, the third thing you do is this, guys. Invite, invite. You know what? Jesus, before he ascended to heaven, looked at his, us, his disciples, and he said, tell the world. Tell the world. I mean, why wouldn't we want to tell the world, right? This is as good a news as it gets. Tell somebody. Share it with them this week. Guys, this next week, somebody will come to church with you that wouldn't come any other time of the year. Just give them, just look. And I know it can be awkward and uncomfortable, but just stop them. Hey, you going to church anywhere this Easter? Come to my church. We got a weird church, so you'll fit right in. Just give them an invitation. Ask them to come with you because they'll hear the life-changing message of what Jesus Christ has done for them and the glorious story of his resurrection. He died so our sins could be forgiven. He rose again so that we could have life everlasting. Father God, we love you. Thank you for the huge price you pay so that we could live forever and forgiven with you. Thank you most of all. Thank you most of all for Jesus. Lord, thank you that because of him, we have life with you. Lord, I pray that you help us to share the good news. Help us to share the good news in the precious name of the one you gave so that we could have life, the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. And everyone said, amen.